let's now uh, move toward the second segment because I would also like to pick your brain on Moldova. Uh, everybody, I'm still talking to David Noack, um, our um, German expert on uh, Central Asia and uh, Eastern Europe um, and the, the the Caucasus and, well, Moldova, Ukraine. You've been writing and, and researching that a lot. And Moldova, we've talked about it several times because Moldova is kind of this place that could have been a flashpoint for the Russia-NATO um, proxy war, but it didn't become come that. We still have up. Uh, we still have Transnistria, which is partially, which is which is de facto separate from from the rest of Georgia. And I know you've visited that because there's a video of you there um, and 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 how how that that uh, region works. But the last time we talked, Moldova was still de facto and de jure neutral. And it tried to stay out of the. It it successfully stayed out of the Russia Russia Ukraine war. It still has trade going on with both of them. Where are we today? Yeah, the interesting part is that in um, Moldova neutrality was just like in Ukraine and also in the beginning in Belarus um, was an avenue to get rid of post Soviet or of Russian influence. So that was uh, the set in the nineties. Um, that they just wanted to get rid of the Russian troops. And they said, we are neutral, we are just between the blocks, and that's the way to go. But then at the turn of the millennium, um, that changed because NATO expanded into first Czech Republic, Hungary, Poland, and then the second wave even in the early 2000s, and also bringing Romania into it. And then the Russian point of view changed and they somehow then, or they suddenly then supported this neutrality because neutrality would also mean not joining NATO in the case of Moldova, just like in the case of Ukraine. Um, and that's why um, often the so-called pro-Russian parties in Moldova are the most neutralist party. And the pro-Western parties always like to talk about, well, maybe we could abandon neutrality and then join first the EU, maybe even NATO or something like that. And then the war started. And then there's there was a new political consensus. Okay, we stick to neutrality because we don't want to get involved into that conflict. Um, I mean, on a political level or on, on a symbolic level, the pro-Western government, especially the pro-Western president Maya Sandu, a former World Bank executive, um, she always supports um, Ukraine on a yeah on a symbolic level. But there is no uh, there are no military relations or any uh, indirect involvement. So even the shipments of arms from the NATO countries to Ukraine, they would never cross um, Moldova because it's neutral. And the interesting part in uh, in Moldova is this breakaway state of Transnistria, because um, when there were discussions about uh, this breakaway state rejoining Moldova. Um, especially in the early 2000s, there was the Cossack Memorandum in 2003. It looked like it would be close to a settlement, but then, um, yeah, that um, didn't succeed. Um, and this breakaway state always um, had the Russian position, well, if we rejoin, then the unified state would be neutral. And then the war begins um, in February 2022. And um, the, the, the president of, the, of Transnistria, um, he suddenly declared his his de facto state even neutral as well. I mean, there are Russian troops, Russian troops in Transnistria, but they are mostly Russian officers, and then Transnistrian soldiers with Russian passports wearing Russian uniforms. But there is no supply line because in 2015 Ukraine cut the supply through Odessa and for that Russian troop um, um, contingent or for that uh, deployment there, and but they are not involved in the war. Um, and yeah, Transnistria is neutral and Moldova is neutral. And I think it's important to point out the troops, the Russian troops in Transnistria are actually have a UN mandate, right? They are official peacekeepers under a UN mandate, no? No, it's not a UN mandate. Um, there was there was a short civil war in the early 1990s. And as the settlement of the war, there was a tripartite um peace corps and the three parties are the moldovan troops the transnistrian troops themselves and the russian troops so as part of this agreement um that um there are russian troops but there are further russian troops because there is a ammunition depot uh, in in the northern part of transnistria where most of the weapons that the soviet troops in 
Eastern Germany, Hungary, Czechoslovakia had. And they dumped their ammunition in Transnistria. And then, yeah, the troops got to solve. But the, there's a huge ammunition depot. And we don't know how secure that is. There was, I think, two or three years ago in Kazakhstan, a similar depot that just exploded because it's um, the, the weapons, they, they just rot there. And then suddenly they exploded. So in Kazakhstan, there was a small catastrophe. If something like that would happen in Transnistria, that would affect first Transnistria then core Moldova or the, the Republic of Moldova and Ukraine. So that would be uh, an international or that could be an international disaster. And the Russian troops that guard those de this depot, they're not part of the um, of the peace peace force of the tripartite peace force there. And um, but there is no UN mandate. And um, I got that wrong. But, mm. but if um, they would have to withdraw, um, yeah, then there would be uh, the the armistice would have been uh, there, there would have to be a peace settlement a final peace settlement and then they could withdraw but so far there is no peace settlement there was this cossack memorandum 20 years ago that didn't succeed and um, currently we have some negotiations again between the conflict parties but uh, they are not even close to a peace settlement and that's why the russian troops remain there and the interesting part with transnistria is that um, Transnistria joined the EU Association Agreement of Moldova because most of their exports, even before the war, went to the European Union. Um, they export machinery, textiles, no, mostly textiles, but also some beverages and also some ag agricultural products. And their only port to the east was always Odessa. And then the war started. The Ukrainians shut the border. They even blew up some bridges. So there is no direct traffic between Transnistria and Ukraine. So the Transnistrian can't export to Russia anymore because they don't get to Odessa and then take a ship to, to Russia. That's why most of the Transnistrian exports now um, go to the EU or more than 90% go to the EU. And as I've analyzed um, for a paper for the um, Eastern European Conference in Tartu last year, um, the Transnistrian government um, meets or government representatives often meet um, American, British, and also the German, the German ambassador in Moldova. So they, I think they are going to negotiate some kind of settlement. The Russians are still involved because there is this Russian peace um, or this um, troop contingent there. Um, but on economic terms, Transnistria is turning more and more to the West. So Moldova is neutral with a pro-Western government, with a pro-EU government that also now try to, tries to leave the Commonwealth of Independent State. Uh, Moldova was the last state to join the Commonwealth of Independent States and um, is now cur currently the only CIS country not bordering any other CIS country because Ukraine already left it. Um, and Moldova only borders Ukraine on the one hand, uh, on the one side, and then uh, Romania on the other side. Um, so they are leaving the CIS. They are um, absolutely pro-EU integration, on not NATO integration, only EU integration, because they stick to neutrality and they continue to stick to that uh, in the course of the war. Um, and then we have Transnistria, and the interesting part will be, will there be any way to resolve the conflict to, I don't know, give um, the Transnistrian oligarchs some perspective in a reunified Moldova and then a neutral um, Moldova, unified Moldova could um, could join the, yeah, I don't know, EU, maybe not as a full member, but um, yeah, get even closer to, to EU or not. Thank you very much for that for that clarification. Because uh, the the other thing that's really important is I think that the the, the different the difference between Transnistria and Moldova proper is not one of ethnicity or language, right? It is one of actual political <laughs> political alignment. The the Transnistrians, if I remember our last uh, conversation correctly, are just the people from the former Soviet Union who wanted to remain very closely associated, who actually wanted to remain part of of whatever it whatever union would be left after others had left right and then that it, it was a it's a political issue why they why they um went into and and, and separated transnistria de facto from the rest of moldova yeah in, in moldova um it got us industrialized and um yeah more, more urbanized in in the 19 starting in the 1950s 1960s when it was a part of the soviet union and then in the 1970s 1980s 
and there was kind of a glass ceiling for the Moldovans because before the 50s, they were mostly living in the countryside. Then they moved into the cities, they studied, and then, but they couldn't get into the higher ranks of the political elite, of the military elite, of the KGB back then in the Soviet Union. And then there was um, this movement for a clear distinction. We have a clear break. We just break away from the Soviet Union and then we make Moldova the state of the Moldovans. And uh, the, the um, remaining political elite that was part of the Soviet Union, they then moved or were heavily concentrated in Transnistria. Some parts even moved from, from the Moldovan capital uh, there. And they said, well, we want to um, yeah, be part of the new union that Gorbachev proposed or some kind of new arrangement. And um, yeah, then they moved there. And then there was the short civil war that Transnistria more or less won because I mean they they had their def they have their de, de facto independence since then, and it just got ended because Alexander Lebed, considered the Russian Napoleon, just uh, ordered his troops to move between the front lines and then stop the fighting. And uh, in Transnistria, we have this state that also considers himself Moldovan. So the official state is the um, Prit. Nestrovia Moldovska Respublika, so the Transnistrian Moldovan Republic, so they also consider themselves Moldovan, and one third of the population in Transnistria is Ukrainian, one third is Russian, one third is Moldovan, but their lingua franca is always Russian, so they speak Russian, and they are also closer culturally because the um, Russian Orthodox Church has a president a presence there, and they're um, they're stronger there. Um, but it's mostly, um, yeah, it was a, a, a political conflict. And then uh, beginning in the 2000s with privatizations, new oligarchs emerged. And the interesting part is that uh, in Transnistria due to this special status, because they are not members of the IMF of the World Bank, no free trade agreements um, um, were applied there. And they still had their industrial base there. And those oligarchs got stronger than the Moldovan oligarchs. And for the 2000s and 2010s, it was always, um, yeah, the whispering was always that if Transnistria would join more, then the Transnistrian oligarchs could overpower the Moldovan oligarchs. <laughs> and that's why the Moldovan oligarchs don't have any interest in that. So that's why there are several parties in Moldova and Transnistria who don't want to resolve the conflict, but it needs to be resolved because there's this ammunition depot in northern Transnistria. There needs to be some kind of settlement and also the Russian troops. Um, I mean, it has to be agreed upon between all conflict parties, maybe even Ukraine, what has to be done with those Russian troops and if they have to withdraw uh, or not. Um, in the Cossack memorandum, it was agreed that they would remain for 20 years and then leave after that. And the Cossack memorandum was, I think it was 20 years. And that was in 20, uh, 2003. So if that would have succeeded, then the Russian troops would already left. But yeah, they got, that got prevented um, back then or that didn't succeed. Um, but there needs to be some kind of settlement because um, in Transnistria, it's it's now part of the EU association agreement. Um, but for many things um, like tech companies or Western companies um, altogether, um, they, they are not operating there. And the problem is that, um, especially for the youth, there are very few perspectives. Many people want to study. I mean, there is a university in Tiraspol, but many people want to study go either to Russia or to Ukraine or to Western countries, and then they leave the country and it's it's mostly a, a pensioner society or a, a society with a with a very high um, medium age. And um, yeah, many young people don't have perspectives there. Yeah, so in a sense, there is an agreement that is keeping the peace, but it is also preventing uh, economic development from taking place properly, right? So, and um and the point that you made that even transnistria declared itself neutral in the conflict between uh russia and ukraine would then also on the one hand it's not completely under international law there's all of this blah 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 you cannot have troops but on the other hand um this this ammunition depot is must be something that ukraine would actually want to get its hands on right there must be or not or not or not at all well, it's mostly old Soviet weapons. I mean, they still use uh, both sides in the war, um, use um, very old weapons uh, sometimes. So 
they could have an interest there, but I think they wouldn't risk um, attacking there without the consent of the Moldovan government. There were some strange incidents. There were some bombings within Transnistria, but mostly on holidays and nobody got hurt. Um, but um, some radio towers and even the KGB central um, were bombed. Then there was some Russian propaganda where those were the Azov fascists. Um, but we don't know what happened there. Some it somehow looked like an inside job. So maybe the, the KGB, in Transnistria, the KGB still remains. And um, I, I think it's considered a pro-Russian bastion. So maybe the secret services tried to, to lure Transnistria into the war. But so far, the Transnistrian government stick to neutrality. Um, yeah, but we have no control there. And there was even an authoritarian turn in Transnistria because uh, in the last elections, only the ruling party, which is the party close to the local oligarchs, um, so the Renewal Party, and that is close to the Shevov group. The Shevov group is this a large uh, oligarch faction in, in Transnistria. Um, they got all the seats. There are some independents, but um, the rest of them. So there's, it's a one-party state now. Um, and uh, yeah, there needs to be some kind of political solution, military solution. I mean, neutrality is is a way to, to solve the conflict and me, maybe even disarmament. And yeah, then the Russian troops had to have to leave. But there has to be some kind of, I don't know, cultural perspectives also for the Transnistrian minority. I mean, it's a small part of the country. It's only one valley um, far in the east of Moldova, um, close to the Dniester River. Um, yeah, but uh, there needs to be a solution in order to bring some um, economic development to, to the whole of Moldova. Uh, including Transnistria. So the next the next elections in Moldova proper are due when and are we expecting the current the current configuration to remain or is there can we expect large movements? Uh, no, that's the uh, well fu funny part. I wouldn't call it funny part, but that's the interesting part. Um, in Moldova currently there is the uh, the PAS, so the Party of Action and Solidarity. It's a pro EU. Some, some even call it pro-NATO, pro-Western um, pro Liberal Party. And they got into power in the recent elections because before that, the socialists government and they mismanaged the corona um, pandemic and they were also a bit of corrupt. Then they got voted out of, well, they are still in the parliament, but they um, the pro-Western Liberal forces um, prevailed. But since they took over, um, most of the polls say that they... Uh, wouldn't gain a majority in the new election. And there is the one issue of the Shaw party. Shaw is a kind of a dubious oligarch from Orhe, from a smaller city uh, uh, in in Moldova. And he, he, it is said that he was involved in the theft of the century where a large um, a, a large sum was yeah, somehow vanished from the state budget and they say well it was this Ilan Shore guy and he lives in Israel because um, he is uh, wanted by the Moldovan authorities but from Israel he often travels to Russia and his party got um, banned um, a year ago and then uh, other parties merged together and um, yeah they somehow are a new unified front now they or also call themselves the Shore Alliance. So it's a, an abbreviation, but it's it's just the same like one year ago. And together, um, the, the Shore Alliance and the Communists and the Socialists, they would have a majority. So uh, a pro-Russian majority would then emerge after the next parliamentary election. And um, the, the but the thing is, when the Socialists governed the last time, first they won on the pro-Russian party ticket, but then they governed, and since most of their foreign trade is with the EU, they um, yeah they weren't that close to Russia. They tried to make some big deals, um, some big trade agreements, but they didn't turn out well. And also, all the trade had to be routed through through Ukraine uh, or and the Black Sea, so that's not very profitable uh, for Moldovans or even for the Russians. And the the socialists in power were far more neutralist and far far more pragmatic uh, than they appear to be on in, in the election campaign and the thing is so now the pro-russian parties would uh, win again but then the question would be well with more than 67 percent of foreign trade with the eu 
you cannot be just pure pro-Russia or just uh, abandon the Euro-Atlantic integration. They would um, abandon any co connections with NATO. They are strict about that. So neutrality also means for the socialists and the communists um, that um, not doing any military exercises with NATO countries. I mean, it's a very strict uh, version of neutrality. But when, when it comes to political and economic dealings, they will have to deal with the uh, European Union as well. Um, and in, in next year, there are going to be presidential elections. And Maya Sandu, so the pro-Western, pro-EU president, um, she will have a sl slim majority or a, a, a tight majority, but it's going to be close. So um, in most polls, she polls as the first uh, on, on, the, on the list. But in the parliamentary elections, the pro-Western forces um, seem not to have a majority. And then we will see what kind of president will we have, what kind of um, majority in the parliament, and how pragmatic both sides will be. And I don't know if there is going to be any breakthrough with Transnistria, even that could also change the, the parliamentary majorities. Um, um, but yeah, we, we don't know yet. So we have to see. Yeah, of course, that's all just a uh, 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 hy hypothesis. But we are nearing the end of the of the time that we've that we've decided to use for the talk. So thank you very much, David Noack, for your update. Um, where can people find you if they want to follow your work? On uh, you're very um, active on X, Twitter. Yeah, mostly on X. So just search David Noack on X, and then you're gonna so, uh, find updates on Moldova, Co the Caucasus, Central Asia, also history topics as well. Yeah, and David posts a lot of very good data, like almost daily on, on what is happening on political issues. I follow him very closely, so I'll put the link into the description. David, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you for inviting me.